أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا خل الله ميثاق النبيين لما آتيتكم لما آتيتكم من كتاب وحكمة ثم جاءكم رسول ثم ثم جاءكم رسول مصدق لما معكم لتؤمنن به ولتنصرن قال اقررتم واخذتم على ذلك اسري قالوا اقررنا قال فاشهدوا وانا معكم من الشاهدين فمن تولى بعد ذلك فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ أَفَغَيْرَ الْغَيْرَ دِينِ اللَّهِ يَبْغُونَ وَلَهُ أَسْلَمَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ طَعْمُ وَكَرْهَمُ وَإِلَيْهِ يُرْجَعُونَ After this, after the translation, we'll do that. In the translation of uh, the verse which I have recited is as follows. And remember the time when Allah took a covenant from the people through the prophets, saying, Whatever I gave you of the book and wisdom, and then there came to you a, mas- a messenger, fulfilling that which is with you, you shall believe in him and help him. And he said, do you agree and do you accept the responsibility which I lay upon you in this matter? They said, we agree. He said, then bear witness and I am with you among the witnesses. Now, whoso turns away after this, then surely those are the transgressors. Do they seek a religion other than Allah's, while to him submits whosoever is in the, is in the heavens and the earth, willingly or unwillingly? Do they seek a religion other than Allah's, while to him submits whosoever is in the heavens and in the earth willingly or unwillingly and to him shall they all be returned. Before I start commenting on the verses which I have just recited, I have been reminding, reminded by the private secretary that uh, one little point which I mentioned to him earlier was uh, needed some more discussion from those verses which have already been covered. You remember I spoke on the verse which says Lat Wala Yukale Muhum Mullaho Wala Yanzuro Elahim Yomal Kayamate Wala Yuzaki him. And I explained that uh, some people believe that it is only applicable to the hereafter, while I believe that it is also applicable here. And having applied here first, then it becomes applicable to the hereafter. And uh, then I said uh, there is, in, in the view of the words yuzakki him, there seems to be no other explanation but to treat it as first applicable here in this world and then as a sort of reflection of the same happening it would uh, appear to be applied again in the hereafter. Later on, next day during my recitation of the Holy Quran I came upon a verse of the Holy Quran in the in Al-Baqarah which uh, the at, you know, which 
invited my attention to the fact that at least in that place it seems that the same words are used, the same subject is discussed in application only to the hereafter. So what would be the answer to the objections which I had read, raised against that uh, single application? That is what I am going to turn to today first and then we will start uh, commentary on the verses which I have recited. That verse of Surah Al-Baqarah 175 reads إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَشْتَرُونَ بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا أُولَائِكَ مَا يَاكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ إِلَّا النَّارِ وَلَا يُكَلِّمُهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَلَا يُزَكِّهِمْ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ Obviously this verse applies to the hereafter and there seems to be no possibility of its uh, uh, application to the first to the, to the world to the life here before the hereafter. So, what would yuzaki him mean in that case? The objection I pointed out was that there is not going to be any taskia in the hereafter. So, unless we believe that it applies here first, and uh, that picture it would be reconstructed in the hereafter, we can't uh, understand the word yuzakim properly. Then my attention was drawn during the study of this verse to another meaning of the word yuzaki, which is certainly applicable to the hereafter alone as well. The Holy Quran speaks of the same word in one particular context where it does not mean purification, but it means declaration that somebody is purified. And that verse is La tuzakku anfosahum wa alamu wa man ittaqa Surah An-Najm verse 33 You can't uh, uh, translate it as never purify yourself because every religion comes for the teaching of purification. This is the main purpose of every religion. How could the Holy Quran say, never try, never even attempt to purify yourself? So here it can only mean, never declare yourself to be muttaqi. Never declare yourself to be pious. It is for God to declare who is pious and who is not. So in the light of this verse, this second verse which I have just decided can be well understood and explained. There it does not mean that God will not purify people in the hereafter, thus those people who have been mentioned, of course, but it only means that they are the people whose crimes are of such grievous nature that already they are condemned. And on the day of resurrection, they will not be declared to be among those who have been purified in the sight of Allah. That means a grievous punishment <coughs> is waiting, awaiting them. And that also resolves the problem of how people will be forgiven. The Christians have discussed this issue. They say those who are sinful, they cannot be counted among those who are, I mean, they cannot be bracketed with those who are pious and who have never sinned. The sin has to be washed before somebody can enter heaven or join the heavenly people. That is why they concocted the whole idea of uh, condonation of, um, um, of, of sins and uh, what's, what's the term? Condonment. Condonement of sins, yes. Now here the Holy Quran has pointed out the way people will be condoned. God in his forgiveness will declare some people purified and that declaration would make them as innocent as newborn babies. So it is the will of God which is going to decide the issue in the end and before they are permitted to enter heaven, whoever would be forgiven would be declared by God as 
Muzakki, uh, as the one who has been counted among the uh, purified people. God is Muzakki. Muzakka would be the Mufun. Yes, those who are Muzakka, that is to say, who have been purified. So here it means, La Yuzakki him, that they will not be counted among those who have been forgiven and who have been declared purified. So this is a very grave sin which has been dealt with so severely to attribute uh, to sell Allah's signs for paltry sum in this world, in this life for small worldly gains and uh, this is what uh, unfortunately the enemies of Ahmadiyyat are doing today. As Holy Quran mentions this, uh, uh, this attitude elsewhere that have you made it a source of uh, livelihood to reject prophets, to deny the truth? What a shame! What, what a source of livelihood it is, you know? So this is very roundly condemned here, this, this inclination of some people to bargain the signs of Allah for paltry sons. Now we turn to the verses, particularly this verse with which I started. It is called Ayat Misaq, Misaqun Nabiyin, which is rather a difficult verse to understand. So, for the sake of the youngsters and those who are not well aware of the Quranic teachings, I would like to explain it generally first. It says that God took a covenant from not ordinary people, but from the prophets. When did that happen? Before the prophets were ever born. Like it is mentioned that God spoke to, to human beings as a whole much before they were, they were born, much before they were created. So what does it mean? It means that there is an inborn teaching in nature which is referred to. When they were created, a covenant was taken from them while they were not yet there. How could it be possible? So they could not have done it consciously. But when something is imprinted uh, in our genes, in our creation, then we don't remember it consciously, but in our true nature, this is how we do, we behave, this is how we understand things. So, as far as the prophets are concerned, they are mentioned as a class, in whose nature it is to submit so completely, that they commit themselves to believe anyone who comes from God as long as he fulfills certain conditions. So it is the study of human nature which is being described, but some people, some commentators would have it that somehow the unborn souls were recalled before their birth by God in some remote past, in some physical place, and there uh, God declared to them something and held them witness to that declaration. And after that, God is reminding us, you see, you remember, I, I took that covenant from you, so hold fast to it or I'll hold you liable to be punished. Now, if you speak of this to most people in the world, here in England, they would deny any knowledge, any, any foggiest memory of such a thing. And they say, what is this claim? We don't agree with that. But the similar co a similar covenant is also mentioned in their book. So you can tell them, all right, if the Holy, you don't agree with the Holy Quran, you can, uh, you can quote your own uh, uh, scriptures where this is mentioned. But this is just incidental. I am trying to explain to the younger generation what is being mentioned here. It is said that a sort of covenant was made between God 
and the prophets. And that covenant was to the effect that if someone ever comes in my name bearing witness to the truth which you have been given, given, not contradicting and denying it, and showing signs of uh, following the teachings of God. Let me read it again. Lama ataitukum min kitabin wa hikmatin. Is akhazallahu mithaq nabiyina lama ataitukum min kitabin wa hikmatin. That as you have been given the book and the law and also the wisdom uh, behind that law. Summa jaakum rasulum musaddiqul lima maakum. Then comes a messenger from Allah who certifies to the truth and supports the doctrines and teachings which have been given you. Latome nunna behi. You will most certainly uh, believe in such a messenger. And not only believe, you are bound to aid him. Kala akhrartum. Then God said, Have you fully understood and do you agree to this? They would say, Yes. We understand and we. Uh, make a covenant with you to the effect. Summa wa khastum ala zalikum isri qalu akrarna. They said yes. Qala fashadu wa ana maakum min shahideen. In the end, God repeated and summarized whatever had been uh, agreed between God and the prophets. Now everything said and done, I remind you again, you, uh, I hold you as witnesses to this. And I will also remain a witness along with you, lest you should forget and start talking of different things. You know, this is the complete statement made here under the word misak, under the, uh, uh, in this verse. And this misak is referred to as misakun nabi yin. So, first of all, let's understand the word misak with the help of Arabic dictionary. Then we'll turn to further explanations and implications of this verse. Vasika, Vathika, Yathiko, Vusukam, Vathikatam, Vamothikan. Vathika, Yathiko means to entrust someone with something, to hold someone as trustee of something, to have complete faith and trust in someone, as such to hand over something for him to him to look after it for you. Secondly, Othaka means to fortify something and to make something impregnable and strong. Vasoka, Vasoka Shao means something has become strong and well fortified. Vasoka Rajolo means some man has made something certain. Vathaka fulanan means somebody has declared some, someone authentic and trustworthy. Tosik as we use is also in Urdu, humne fulan shakhs ki tosik kar di hai. Fulan baat ki tosik kar di hai. Which means we declare it trustworthy fully worthy of belief and, and acceptance. Tawasaku means to come to a treaty and two parties are involved in this uh, uh, inflected form of the usage of this word. Vasaka yu vasaku tawasaku So al vasik is something which is strong and, and, and very powerful uh, not powerful in the sense of having active uh, expressions of power, but built strongly. Similarly, the word wuthqa 
is the feminine gender of the word authak. Authak means somebody, something which is a, co a, a, a strong and even covenant can be referred to as authak. So wutha is the feminine gender of the word authak. And this word is uh, used in this very well-known verse, istamsaqa bil urwatil wusqa lan fisam allaha. That somebody who's been described is like one who has ho who is held fast to a ring which is wusqa. So here wusqa can generally be understood as a ring which is dependable in strength. It will never break. You may leave it, but this ring will never uh, betray you or, or, or uh, desert you. It is powerful enough to be fully dependent. But wuthqa also means a covenant. So as such we understand it to be the covenant of Baya. And the whole subject discussed there is that of Baya. So a, a covenant when you, you become member of a religious society can be referred to as wuthqa. So there are so many other usages, but having always the same central meaning of strength and dependence and trustworthiness. Now why this, has, this issue has been dealt with in this uh, special way? Why every prophet is included in that covenant? The obvious reason is that uh, the concept that God has been speaking differently to different people and uh, there has been uh, a sort of uh, lack of connection and lack of continuity between the messages of God both in sense of space and time is uh, uh, rejected, this concept is rejected soundly in this verse. It is said that all prophets are fundamentally the same. All prophets are not only fundamentally the same, but no true prophet can be against any other prophet. And this is, they are bounden in their duty as if by a covenant with God to support not only the prophets before them, but also the possible prophets which come, may come afterwards. And as such, there is a complete unification of the world of religion. All prophets belong to the same uh, um, community, a very well-knit community, which supports one, uh, every part of which supports the other. Now, this is again in fact, as you must have understood, a, 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 a picture of unity of God. You know, it took, took a picture translated uh, in human terms, in terms of human religious experiences. So, the subject of unity is being discussed. And this is an explanation, a most perfect, beautiful explanation of the unification of God's manifestation. Wherever he manifests himself, in whichever age he manifests himself, there is never a break between one age and the other. And there is a continuity. And there is never a chasm or a void between one part of the world and the other. So the people of God, of God that is to say the prophets of God, are all, all one and the same and well united and uh, completely at one with each other. This is the picture which has been created here. So it doesn't leave any room for uh, any prophet declaring that after me no one is going to ever appear and whoever appears he would be a false man. This is the natural 
corollary born out of this uh, statement and so which is a statement which is so emphatic and so clear. So sh let's study whether this is born out by other verses of the Holy Quran or not in application to Ahadr sallallahu alayhi wa So we turn to another similar verse where Misakun Nabiyyin is mentioned and there are only two verses in the Holy Quran where Misak is related to Nabiyyin. There are other Misaks of course which are mentioned but the word Misakun Nabiyyin is a special coinage of the Holy Quran and as such it, this coined word, phrase is only mentioned in two places. In this general verse where God says I came into covenant, signed a sort of signed a covenant with all the prophets and there Ahadr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is addressed specially regarding this covenant. Let me find out. I've got it somewhere. It's uh, verse 22 of Surah Azab, isn't it? Surah Azab, as far as I remember, it's verse 22. Let's find out. Is this is the one? Okay. okay. Find out. Yes. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ Addressing the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Azab, the verse is not 22 verses, the two verses 8 and 9 which discuss this subject. So it says, referring to the same covenant of course, with Misaku Nabiyyin. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ Remember the time when we took a covenant from all the prophets wa minka including you we also took a covenant from you o prophet of islam wa minnuhim wa ibrahim wa musa wa isa ibn maryam and also we took the same covenant from noah from abraham from moses and from jesus وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيزًا And we took this covenant in the strongest possible terms. مِيثَاقًا غَلِيزًا means a covenant which, you know, which is so fortified and re-fortified that greater strength than that cannot be imagined. لَيَسْأَلَ الصَّادِقِينَ عَنْ صِدْقِهِمْ وَعَادَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا لِيمًا This we did so that we could question and prove the truth of the two people of the world. First to ask them and to then prove to the world these are the true people who have kept this covenant. And also we have prepared a grievous chastisement for those who disbelieve. Now, discussing this further, the classical uh, commentators in the Middle Ages have all discussed these verses, but they have not touched upon mostly. If anybody has touched upon this aspect, I don't remember. But to my knowledge, they have not touched upon this aspect, why a covenant from Ahadr sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after whom there was to be no prophet, what, whatever the nature of that prophet be. Why particularly mention him that you were included in that covenant, which says that whenever a prophet appears after you, who 
uh, agrees with your teaching and supports your, your doctrines, you will most certainly aid him and believe in him. So first of all, let's find out why prophets are mentioned as such, while most often than not, in most likely cases, a prophet is, dies before the next appears. In some cases, of course, rarely, we witness some prophets who are contemporary and who also know each other and support each other and uh, verify the truth of each other, like Abraham and Lot, like Abraham and Isaac and uh, Ismail, and also like Moses and Aaron. But uh, except for this close relationship of father being the prophet as well as the son or some cousin or nephew being the prophet, which are mostly contemporaries, the rest of the prophets died much before the next prophet appeared. And uh, yet the prophets are held responsible for this covenant and said, we positively took this promise from you that you would support the next prophet if he fulfills these conditions. So all the commenta commentators are generally agree that ultimately what it means is that a promise is taken from the prophets but what is kept in mind is their people and their followers. Some people say that prophets are mentioned in the first place as leaders, like Malaika are mentioned and Satan is also included in, in, in that story, that first fable we, we come across in the Holy Quran about uh, prostration to Adam. So sometimes leaders are mentioned and what is meant is their followers. But some, pro some uh, commentators say the prophets do not uh, uh, come into picture at all here. The word implies their people and their followers and this is omitted here sometimes in, in some expressions. One part of the statement is omitted because it's too obvious. It's understood. understood and taken for granted. So they say that the covenant was not with the prophets but with their people. As such, you have to imagine even a larger gathering that all the people assembled somehow in, in some remote time and they promised and uh, that would become very difficult to conceive. So I think the best solution is, uh, is, is simple and obvious that the leadership is discussed, but what is meant is their followers, on behalf of them, the leaders sometimes go into covenants and that is binding on everybody, like uh, uh, the heads of states sign agreements. That doesn't mean that every member of the society of that state has to sign that agreement, otherwise he will be absolved of the responsibility. Not at all. The leader signs and everybody is held responsible. So it is the ummat of the Prophet which is, in, which is ultimately responsible for keeping this covenant. So if the ummah of Ahadra wasallam was not to be included in this covenant because there was to be no Prophet whatever, whatever nature, why did the Holy Quran say Vaminka? We also included you, that is to say your followers, your people in that covenant. This question is always omitted. Nobody touches upon it. Obviously, why? You know that they couldn't answer it, they couldn't explain it. They just skipped by. They, they, they you know, made a contour around this and uh, started discussing other things. So that shows a basic weakness in human character. That is the tendency when it develops further, it becomes a crime and most condemnable crime in the sight of God. But because they are all pious people I know and you know, so there was, that was just an expression of some inner weakness. They could not resolve this conflict and paradox. They firmly believed that no sort of prophet would ever appear after the Holy Founder of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
and they couldn't understand this contradiction. They couldn't attribute contradiction to the Holy Quran. So they, 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 they better not touch upon it. They left it to God to explain. But they did not speak against the possibility either in this context. They kept quiet. Except for one Muslim scholar. And he stands out in this. And that one is Madhudi. Knowing all this, discussing everything regarding this, he says, and I quote from Tafibul Quran, first volume, page 269, Yaha itni baat samaj leni chahiye, ke Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam se pehle, har nabi se yehi aid liha jata raha hai. Very clear, isn't it? Which means that this must be well understood here before we proceed further. That before the time of Hazrat Rasul Akram sallallahu alayhi wa the founder of Islam, this covenant was taken from every other prophet. Or isi bina par har nabi ne apni ummat ko baad ke aane wale nabi ki khabar di hai. And this is the reason why every prophet has spoken of a prophet who would appear later on in their ummah. Lekin na Quran mein, na hadith mein, kahin bhi is amr ka pata nahi chalta ke Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam se aisa ahad liya gaya ho. Neither in the Holy Quran nor in any tradition of the holy founder of Islam, you find even a remote reference, even a reflection of a ref reference to the effect that such covenant was also taken from Rasulullah Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imagine what happened to him, this man, who is supposed to be a great scholar in Islam, who is supposed to have read the Holy Quran hundreds of times. How could he miss this verse of, of Al-Azab? And why couldn't he address this question? That why in, in the same surah, where the verse Khatamun Nabiyyin is mentioned, this uh, 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 covenant is resurrected and uh, invoked and, and brought to light again. And there it is clarified that you are included in this covenant. If not to, remove any possible misunderstanding regarding the verse of Khatam and Nabeen for what other reason? So in the same place, in the same surah, where the verse Khatam and Nabeen is found, this verse is also mentioned with greater clarity regarding its application to Hudur Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, what sort of God-fearing scholar that man was, who says, not even a remote reference is found that this covenant was also taken from Ahadra sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allama Razi, discussing another aspect, of course not this, says that yaha anbiya mein se Musa, Isa, Ibrahim aur Nuh ka zikr kiya hai, Musa aur Isa ka is liye ke Nabi Kareem Nabi Akram صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کے زمانے میں موجود ان کی امتوں پر حجت تمام ہو اور ابراہیم کا اس لیے کہ عرب ان کی فضیلت کے قائل اور ان کے بعض شاعر پر عمل پیرا تھے It says that only four prophets have been mentioned by way of illustration in this uh, covenant Although generally the verse speaks of this covenant having been taken from all the prophets of God, wherever they were, in whatever time they appeared, yet specifically only four have been mentioned. Why, he says, because the people of Moses and Jesus were at the time of Ahazul directly involved in either accepting or rejecting the message of Hazrat Akram Wasallam. So they were directly involved. So that covenant was mentioned with reference to their leaders. And uh, Abraham was mentioned because the Arabs, 
where Ahmad Sallallahu was born and he was one of, the, one of them, they held Abraham in very high esteem. Whether they were believers, whether they were idolaters or not, that, is, that was irrelevant. All Arabs deeply revered Abraham. So, to prove to them that you are also under that covenant and to, it is binding upon you to accept Ahazel who appeared after these prophets. This is the issue, after these prophets. And then he says, Noha was mentioned because he was a sort of second Adam. Because after the flood, they believe all the mankind was destroyed except the descendants of Noah. So he is the second beginning of, of, of the human race. So as such, when Noah is mentioned, the whole world is mentioned. Why not Adam? Because there is no need now. The children of Adam were destroyed, all of them, except those who lived as progeny of, a, of Noah and those who believed in him. So those who are a matter of the past and remote past have turned into tales. They don't, don't lo any longer matter. They should not be addressed. Naturally not. So those people among the human beings who matter are the children of Noah or the progeny or the believers in Noah who survived the great deluge. But on this, he seems to be agreed that it was binding on all mankind that after these prophets were mentioned, if a prophet came, they would believe in him and they would support him, provided he fulfilled the conditions mentioned. And when this covenant was also taken from Ahadur why, to whom would, he, would his followers support if there was no prophet to come at all? So this is a, the most final and irrefutable argument in favor of our claim that subordinate prophets can still be born. Why subordinate particularly here? Because it, the, the verse speaks of the whole mankind as being addressed by Ahmad and elsewhere it is made clear that he was a prophet of all mankind. So when a prophet for the whole universe, for the whole mankind had appeared, and only that prophet could be true who would support him fully, and could not go out of, of his domain, because he covered everything. It was impossible for an independent prophet to be born afterwards because there was no area left which was not covered by Ahmad Sallallahu You know, it reminds one of the same joke which I have been telling you. It's very interesting. Somebody, not a joke, but a very, very deep uh, lesson to mankind of its limitation. It is said that one uh, Majzub, somebody who is half-witted, but half-witted in a good sense, being pious and being given up to God and his memory, his uh, half turned to mankind and half to God, you know, lives in that state of intermedia living, as we, when we refer to such people as Majzu. One eye open towards God and the other eye open towards mankind, and they live hovering in between the two. So such a man once pondering over the affairs of the world and the miseries and tragedies, ultimately got, uh, you know, dis deeply disappointed. So much misery, so much uh, uh, ignorance, darkness, suffering, cruelty. So once he says, he declared to God that he doesn't like his world. And having done so, he started declaring to everybody, look here, I have told God, I have told God, started jumping and dancing. Everybody uh, started asking, what have you told God? He said, I don't like your world. That's all, finished. So after a few days of dancing and jumping, he was seen again, 
very downtrodden and uh, I mean with hang, head hanging low and d deeply uh, sort of uh, gloomy. gloomy, you know, downhearted. So people said, what's the matter with you? you were t a few days ago you were so exhilarated and in such a jolly, jumping, dancing mood. What has happened to you? Here what has happened is the answer has come from God to my comments. And what would be that answer? The answer is, all right, whosever world you like, you go, leave mine. <laughs> leave mine alone. You don't like it, leave. Go to any world, as you please, which is not created by me. <laughs> he said, where can I go? So where can a prophet go to f bring a new teaching to the world? when the whole world is covered and occupied by Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu <coughs> and is made subservient to him totally and completely for all times to come. So, when he is mentioned as one party in, involved in that covenant, it means that after you also prophets may come. If they support and you entirely and your message entirely, then your ummah, your people are bound to accept them. But if he contradicts the Holy Quran and your, or your teachings, then of course he, he's, uh, you're not concerned with him. Let him go his way. So this verse is a very complete and uh, comprehensive and exhaustive commentary on the issue of khat e Now again, turning to the issue of unity of God, now the Holy Quran makes it more and more clear the nature of the unity as proclaimed by Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Gradually it is leading us to a wider concept of the world and a global concept of religion. First it's mentioned that although smaller prophets appeared addressing the smaller people, regional people, clannish or tribal people in various uh, geographical entities, but they were all the same. So unity was not broken. Now it declares that a global prophet has appeared which has unified all these prophets who spoke of him essentially when they, they uh, were committed to this covenant. And that prophet has come which covers the entire universe. So there is one God and one final messenger who has addressed the whole universe on behalf of God. So the unity has become fully manifested, full circle. And uh, no area of the unity is left unattended. This is Taaloila Kalimatin Savaim Bena Nava Benakum. If unity is what you claim, then having explained all aspects of unity, we, we, we call you to this unity. It is perfect and consummate. Incidentally, it may be observed that. Uh, it is the beauty of the Holy Quran and the language and the style that uh, keeping in view the people it is addressing, it uses their uh, jargons and the language which they understand best and also creates some situations of irony against them of course. Now here the main uh, uh, objects of address were Christians, as you know, because this verse, speaks, uh, this surah s begins with the mention of a delegation from uh, what was the place? Najran, who were Christians, and a debate was held. You have heard all about it. So they believed in Trinity. 
claiming the unity of God, yet they believed in Trinity. So the Holy Quran responds to them and rebuts their arguments in sorts of trinities. Three objections are raised against their concept of trinity in doctrine as well as in practices. And always three points. This is the innate beauty of the Holy Quran. This is why this is a book which, which, is, which surpasses every other in the most beautiful expression of languages. It applies to every situation and fits so perfectly, it becomes so surprising. There is nothing artificial or forced about it. Those three, of course, are natural arguments against their claim of unity, and uh, they had broken unity in three places. They believed in Trinity. Those three places were pointed out in their doctrine. And then they had broken Trinity in practices in three places. Those three pra pra places have been pointed out and specially brought to the focus of our attention. So this is the treatment, as you say, to pay somebody in the same coins. Their coin, coins of Trinity, is fully returned to the advantage of Islamic teaching. Now this all, these I have already covered. I am just uh, scanning through lest I might have missed a point. Imam Razi also says that those who have been mentioned as prophets, as the other party of the covenant, in fact are not prophets themselves but their ummah and this covenant is binding upon them. Here in this verse too, some commentators have shown the same old tendency of binding these verses to some incidents that occurred during the time of the Holy Prophet They say the Jews did this, so a, a verse was relieved, re, uh, revealed. The Christians did this, a verse was revealed. The uh, ad idolaters did this, and so on and so forth. Alama Razi rejects this tendency and says this is full of dangers and it uh, belittles the beauty of the Holy Quran if you overemphasize the incidents which led to the revelation of these uh, great teachings because he says in itself whether these things had happened or not the Holy Quran was bound to be revealed. It is a perfect book. And it is not dependent on small incidents here and there, but naturally, this is also the beauty of its uh, teaching. You know, it's a condition of fasahat balagha the, the highest class of oratory, that it should fulfill the need of the occasion. This is one of the definitions. Muqtazai hal or ikhtazai hal ke mutabikho. This is what we were taught in, in grammar. Any language, any expression, any statement which suits the occasion perfectly is fasi and belief. So sometimes that verse was kept from revelation until a situation arrived where it fitted exactly. So that there are incidents of, we can't deny that. But to say that they caused this to be revealed, this is totally wrong. Alama Razi discusses one of these verses, which we have already covered, that Allah be Ibrahim. You know, we, who is Allah? Who is nearer to Abraham? So he says that it is reported that there were two uh, sections of Ahle Kitab, the people of the book, who came to Ahadur Sallallahu for his decision on certain point which they were disputing between themselves. And the point was, who among us 
is closer to Abraham. So we have come to you to declare, to pass the judgment. Is at this, Rasulullah Sallam said, neither of the you, I am closer. So this is the occasion why this verse was revealed. Hazrat Imam Rai said, this is absurd. <laughs> Absolutely, this belittles the, the, the grace and the beauty of this verse, which fits into the subject discussed. And it has nothing to do with the, any such concocted story. Only Tafsir Husseini, comparatively modern Tafsir in Urdu, mentions this, that the same uh, covenant of the prophets was also taken from Rasulullah Sallam. Although he doesn't develop this theme further, again afraid of its natural consequences, but uh, he is one of those commentators who has dared to enter this, and, uh, this, this domain and admit openly that Ahadrat Sallallahu Sallam was also a party to this covenant. So he writes, وَإِذَا خَزْنَا يَاد رَكْهُ لِيَا هَمْنَي مِنَ النَّبِيِّنَا نَبِيُّوں سے مِسَاقَهُمْ اَحَدْ اُن کا اس بات پر کہ خدا کی عبادت کریں اور خدا کی عبادت کی طرف بلائیں اور ایک دوسرے کی تصدیق کریں یا ہر ایک کو بشارت دیں اس پیغمبر کی کہ ان کے بعد ہوگا اور یہ اَحَدْ پیغمبروں سے روزِ الست میں لیا گیا وَمِن کا اور لِيَا هَمْنَي تُجھ سے بھی اے محمد یہ اَحَد so, although he doesn't say what would be the implication of this later on, but he admits this, there is no denying this, this is very clear that Rasulullah was also made a part of this covenant. This is Tafsir Husseini, Urdu, Matbua, Naval Kishore, is it Naval Kishore or what is the term? Uh, some Indian Urdu Dan should tell. Ha, like now? Is it Nol Kishore or Naval Kishore? Kishore. That I know. But how do you pronounce it? Noval Kishore. Noval Kishore. Not Naval but Noval. So this is the Noval Kishore, a very famous press of Lucknow, which has published it. And it is the second volume, page 256. Now, I turn to some Christian commentators regarding this verse. The Covenant of the Prophets, verse 82, commentary on al Imran, Ruku 9, by Veri. You know Veri, of course, I haven't been mentioning him. He's one of the most... Uh, rabid uh, enemy of Islam among the Orientalists. And uh, he is so full of hatred and venom that he sometimes he's, he loses his sense of balance completely. Like here in this verse you will find him having lost that sense. Particularly you will find such people most uh, uh, extremely agitated adversely and, and negatively agitated, when they discover a fine point of extreme beauty and singular beauty in the Holy Quran. They are so deeply hurt that they want to prove that this is the worst possible point that a book could make, you know. That is their attitude. And here, this is an attempt made by Veri on this most beautiful verse of the Holy Quran. And one of the most beautiful verses of the Holy Quran. He says, some commentators interpret this of the children of Israel themselves, of whose race the prophets were. But others say, the so, what is this, sold? Sold, I think it should be, so, at these unnecessarily, I mean, extra, put extra, the word should be souls the souls of all the prophets, even of those who were not yet born, were present on Mount Sinai 
when God gave the law to Moses and that they entered into the covenant here mentioned with him a story borrowed by Muhammad from the Talmudists and therefore most probably his true meaning in this place and that's end. What do you mean? Have you left some 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 part of the statement? But anyway, now this is sale. He finishes here, quoting sale, quote unquote. This the, all that statement which I read to you was from sale, who also it belongs to the same category as as very is. Now the commentary of very. The property alluded to here is probably the prophecy. Property, it is written property here. So, kindly, with no time available to you, kindly please uh, recheck. Eh? The prophet, prophecy alluded to here is probably the general promise of the Messiah contained in such messages as Deuteronomy. Uh, the number is given and which constituted the spirit of prophecy the only direct statement in the Quran giving the very words of prophecy is founded in chapter uh, 30, 31 or 20 this is Roman letters I don't L X 1 I how would you read it on the right uh, of the letter is, is to be deducted or added? Added. So that would be 51. No, 61. L is 50. That's right. Uh, the, the chapter 61, where the allusion is to the paraclete. In either case, the Prophet of Arabia made a serious mistake. The desperation of his followers to find the prophecies of the Bible relating to him is manifested at one time by their attempts to disprove the genuineness of the same at another time by their endeavors to show that Deuteronomy as mentioned before and also in chapter such and such really refer to their prophet. For a specimen of the letter, the reader is referred to essays on the life of Muhammad by Sayyid Ahmad Khan Bahadur. Now here, it is rather a involved statement. It has to be further explained before you understand the implication of what he is uh, attempting to explain. Where he says, here is the proof that Prophet Muhammad, along with his followers, peace be upon them, was caught in a very difficult situation. They were trying frantically to prove that uh, Prophet Muhammad was mentioned in one of the earlier prophecies. And this verse further enhances the need to do this. Because according to this verse, he says he borrowed this verse from, uh, from Talmud. As if, you know, up till now you didn't know that this was mentioned in Talmud. Very few people to, in the world today uh, know that this is mentioned in Talmud. But as if Anandar had complete access to all the libraries of the Jewish literature and he could borrow things from here and there. But that is absurd in itself. Anyway, he says he borrowed it from Talmud. And having borrowed it from Talmud, he declared to the people, to his own people, that my name is also mentioned. Because it is said that God had taken a covenant that whoever would follow you, you must support him. First of all, this is a misunderstanding of the whole statement. Complete confusion in the mind of Vary. In this place, it is not mentioned that Ahadur sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was mentioned by name in this covenant. Although some commentators have written that he was the foremost person 
uh, who was uh, potentially mentioned in this, this uh, covenant, but not specifically. But this is a confusion in the mind of Vary. So first he builds this confusion and then uh, attacks Islam on this point. He said, having first borrowed this statement from Talmud, then having declared to, to his followers that my name is also mentioned, he and his followers find themselves in great difficulty in proving this and to find the place where they are mentioned. So they quote place that and that and I will speak of that later now. And he says nothing is proved, it is all false. Now the fact is that the Holy Quran is making a general statement that prof the covenants of this nature were taken from all the prophets. It was the responsibility of the Muslims to prove at least in case of the Jewish prophets that this covenant was taken. So what Vary is doing is only helping us, only proving the truth of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Although he is trying to avoid it and uh, doing it in a different way so that the truth is not detected but an attack is made instead. But what he has done is simply resolved our problem. If the Christians asked you, for instance, where is this covenant mentioned? You would not be able to put your fingers onto it because you, had not, you have not read Talmud and your knowledge of Christianity and Judaism is, is very poor. So now he has helped us. Remember this place. At least there it is mentioned clearly, but also it is mentioned in some other places that a covenant of some sort was taken. Only different, the difference is that according to the Old Testament, this covenant is placed very close in, in the time of our memory, within, in the midst of the religious history of, of Judaism. It speaks of only Moses. Now, as far as Moses and his followers are concerned, of course this becomes binding upon them. That is all right. But it speaks only vaguely of a covenant as if it was actually taken during the lifetime of Moses. What about the earlier prophets? Why what was not a covenant taken from them if it, if it was of a fundamental importance? So that statement to which Vary is referring is a very defective and incomplete statement. It's, it's, it, is, it is not as beautiful and perfect because you cannot translate it as something as imprinted in nature something which has become an inborn teaching with man. But the Holy Quran statement is not only uh, much wider in this sense, but also is much deeper and gives you allowance to interpret it rationally and reasonably in scientific terms. But this covenant which is mentioned in the Old Testament to which Vary is referring, is, uh, you know, is, 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 cannot be rationally supported at all. How can you say that Moses at a certain time at, at, the, at the mountain uh, was surrounded by all the souls of the world and, and, and prophets and actually a covenant was taken from him at that time while the prophets who appeared also belonged to earlier ages. So it was rather late in life for God to think of this covenant when a, a large number of prophets had already passed before Moses. But he hurriedly recalled them and uh, gathered them around Moses and took a sort of covenant. This is not to be compared with the beauty of Islamic teachings at all. Now as far as, th as, far as that uh, Deuteronomy and other men other uh, references are concerned, which are mentioned here. Let me read from there and uh, tell you exactly what Vary has in mind. But before that also I read from Rodwell on this very subject. He says, Assembled on Mount Sinai, 
compare the Jewish legend that all the prophets, even those who were not yet born, were present on Mount Sinai when God gave the law to Moses. See Shemot Rabbah, Parasha 28. This is the reference. According to which, not only the prophetic, but the, uh, the rabbis, or rabbis, it should be, rabbis, perhaps, of every generation were present at the giving of the law. So it can include also the rabbis as being present. Now Deuteronomy 18, 14.22 has been mentioned by Veri. Unless we read it, we will not understand what he means by that. It reads from 14 to verses 22. These nations whose place you are taking listen to soothsayers and argue and, and, and augurs but the Lord your God. Is it do not listen or listen to? These nations whose place you are taking listen to soothsayers and augurs but the Lord your God. But the Lord your God implies that the word not is missing from before. Do not listen to soothsayers, but listen to God. Perhaps that would be, check it up please. Tomorrow we will clarify it. Does not permit you to do this. 15. But the Lord your God does not permit you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up a prophet from among you like myself and you shall listen to him. This is the 18th chapter, the verse 14, which the Muslims generally quote, and now you will, you will recall it, that Ahmadis are also very familiar with this. These are the, uh, the words, or words to this effect in Urdu, with which we are familiar. All this, follow, all this follows from your request to the Lord, your God, on Horeb, on the day of the assembly. There you said, let us not hear again the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire again, or we shall die. This is very significant. This speaks of a concept of, 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 of the khatme type which is uh, nowadays so popular with some hostile mullahs against Ahmadiyya. This concept was first mentioned by the people according to the Old Testament who were gathered there to whom Lord spoke. They said let it be the last thing that we ever hear from God or from a person on behalf of God. We are afraid this message, you know, puts so many responsibilities on our shoulders. We may die if another person speaks. So what the Deuteronomy is telling us is, despite their wish, that let, be, let it be the end of prophecy with Moses, and no other prophet should ever appear afterwards, the response of God was that, no, I shall raise a prophet from among you, but from your brethren this time, who would be like unto the Prophet Moses. So that means this plea was rejected, and this is the essence of this covenant, in fact, that somebody would come, and you must uh, uh, teach your followers that this should be the position taken by them whenever somebody comes from God and declares himself, judge him by his teaching. If that teaching is in agreement with your teaching, then you have no right to oppose him. It is, on the other hand, your responsibility to fully support such a person. What this they have said is right, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. Now, this is the absurdity uh, because uh, this seems that this language has been corrupted by human people, human beings. What they demanded from God was a completely different thing. 
and the answer is in response to your, your demand, I am going to raise a prophet. While earlier they had requested God that please never raise a prophet again, never speak to us again. So this is the problem with Bible. It is this type of language which is rejected by the Holy Quran as interpolation. But as far as the essence of the message is concerned, it has never been rejected by the Holy Quran. So when very and such like commentators speak of Islam as uh, contradictory in its statements, it is because they don't understand this thing. He has spoken very harshly on this attitude of Islam that on the one hand it supports, and this is also mentioned in, in, in this statement I have read to you, it supports the teachings of the Bible and depends for this biblical, ex, uh, uh, upon the biblical uh, prophecies to prove the truth of the holy founder of Islam. And at other places it rejects Bible as something interpolated. The holy Quran has never totally rejected the Bible. It always refers to the Bible as something which has been interpolated in places. But in other places it still contains pure, unadulterated teaching by God. So this is one of those instances where a teaching is mentioned, but also you find, find signs of small adulterations here and there to make the things inconsistent and difficult to understand. What they have said is right, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, one of their own race. Now it was said from among you, this has been translated as one of their own race, and I will put my words into his mouth. He shall convey all my commands to them. And if anyone does not listen to the words which he will speak in my name, I will require satisfaction from him. Now, this they explain by saying that uh, although prophets, a prophet is promised, but what the people gathered on Mount Sinai actually requested from God was that we do not want to hear directly from you. This direct address is over much. So God understood the message, said, all right, from now on I'll always speak through others. As if up till then he had always been speaking directly. It is all a concocted story. It is not true because this is not a thing which actually happened at all. When were the rabbis, even those who were unborn, directly spoken to by God? So this is all an, a, a very imperfect attempt and defective attempt to uh, divert the attention from this apparent uh, paradox and contradiction in this biblical statement. What they said was not that we can't, we can't listen directly to you, so please speak through others. What they said was enough of prophecy, we will accept Moses, but no more please. And God said no. I am going to raise a prophet, but in a very interesting way, in a very ironical way as well, God says, all right, I'll end up this line, but what we'll do, I will turn to the brothers of, of, of uh, Isaac and turn to the other side and hold my covenant with them next time. This is the message of Deuteronomy, where Ahadur <laughs> is clearly mentioned. From among the brothers, who are the brothers? If the line of Isaac is to be treated as one continuous uh, line of the Isaac's progeny, then the brothers simply uh, uh, refer to the progeny of Ismail and nobody else. So that is what uh, we argue from this. But the prophet who presumes to utter in my name what I have not commanded him, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. If you ask yourselves, how shall we recognize a word that the Lord has not uttered? This is the answer. When the word spoken by the prophet is the same of the Lord, 
is not fulfilled in the name of the Lord is not fulfilled and does not come true it is not a word spoken by the Lord the prophet has spoken presum uh, presumptuously do not hold him in awe this is a complete reference to the economy the other reference which he gave was that was that of John 14 verses 15 to 26 this reads if you love me you will obey me my commands and I'll ask the father and he will give you another to be your advocate who will be with you forever the spirit of truth the world cannot receive the world cannot receive him because the world neither sees nor knows him but you know him because he dwells with you and in you I will not leave you bereft I am coming back to you in a little while the world will see me no longer but you will see me because I live you too will live then you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you the man who has received my commands and obeys them he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and disclose myself to him Judas asked him the other Judas not Iscariot, Iscariot, Iscariot Lord what can have happened that you mean to disclose yourself to us alone and not to the world Jesus replied anyone who loves me will heed what I say then my father will love him and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him but he who does not love me does not heed what I say and the word you hear is not mine it is the word of the father who sent me I have told you all this while I am all this while I am still here with you but your advocate the Holy Spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you everything and will call to mind all that I have told you this is the full text of this verse there is not time left for me to discuss it further so I'll turn to it tomorrow first time during the death this is a very important verse to which he has rightly referred from which the Muslims attempt according to him to prove the point that Allah is mentioned but he claims that he is not even remotely mentioned here it is only the Holy Spirit of which Jesus Christ is speaking but I will explain tomorrow why it is the same verse which has been mentioned in the Holy Quran not in this in, in, in connection with the verse of the Misaq but in another connection where you remember in Surah Asaf was it in Surah Asaf? yes uh, oh, uh, the Holy Quran says that uh, previously which verse which surah is this yeah isn't it yes yes you remember the full verse? Yes, yes please. Wa is kala is ab no Maryam alilla wa re. Wa is kala is ab no Maryam. Inni Rasulullah hai lekum musaddiqul le ma baina yadiya mina torate wa mubashiram be Rasuli yati min badis muhammad. This is the verse which the Muslims connect with this statement of John. Now it is for us to see whether Jesus Christ did promise a person whose name was Ahmed or not or whether 
it is the Muslims who, who are wrong in claiming this or Christians who are, have definitely distorted this message in translation and uh, changed the meaning to a degree that it is no longer recognizable. But still, even in this form, uh, you can uh, positively read the underlining meaning that a new prophet is mentioned as uh, mentioned uh, in, in Deuteronomy, uh, of which I have read already. But because no time is left, tomorrow, inshallah, we'll start from here.